Welcome to the Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I'm privileged and excited to be in conversation with a visual artist, writer, teacher, and curator living in good old Baltimore, Maryland. Please welcome Sarah Clough. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. And um, as as we kind of start off and get into, I feel like we we did the pre-podcast before this podcast. Mm-hmm. But um um, could you tell us a bit about your background, your your first experiences in art? Just share the get get cluff with it. Share, share the story. <laughs> get cluff with it. Oh wow, that 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 can't be done. All right. Well, I I found myself in Baltimore, um, you know, several years ago. I've been here for about six years. I came out here for grad school um, and doing art at MICA. And um, before that, I spent 18 years in Oklahoma. Oklahoma City um, was where I spent 10 of those years. Um, So I'm from the Midwest, and um, it's been really wonderful in Baltimore for the most part. Um, Lots and lots to do. Um, I guess if I'm thinking way, way back, like (laughs) first art experience, I do recall like sitting at the dining table with just like printer paper and big pens and just like scribbling until they all ran out of ink so I think I was really you know into mark making from an early age um I guess I was a what is it an abstract artist an expressionist (laughs) like right off the bat um but you know it beat me scrawling on the wall so that's what (laughs) that's what my parents gave me but yeah it kept me occupied I've always been fascinated with it like to me it's uh it's interesting every time each and every time um but yeah I got better I got better I definitely it's definitely visual art is something I've worked at and uh you know since early childhood I love it that's great that's great um I I, I look back and you know when I I start thinking about that question I'm like what was one of the early things that I was doing what was I into and you know I I think some of those early things you you're replicating you're taking into account things that you're seeing like i was sketching mm-hmm. drawing comic book characters and mm-hmm. i still have my old art bag uh, in my closet in the, in the studio and i have these old um wizard magazines that i used to draw out of and it's like i'm gonna draw the x-men i'm gonna draw the power range and these different characters oh and yeah yes. that's what i was into so was there something that comes to mind that you were into like as as a young person and you're like I'm going to try to draw this. I'm going to try to replicate this. I'm going to try to make this from a, from a, from a, from an arts perspective. Oh, absolutely. Just like you mentioned, like I was very, very into illustration and cartoons. So like what I saw, you know, uh, on VHS and, um, on TV was what I drew. And I just, I remember really, getting into what is it animaniacs <laughs> i was into animaniacs so hard um i loved drawing them i think they did you know really bizarre facial expressions that i really appreciated they were really funny um i was also into you know what is it i, I was so into specifically like what is it the late 80s early 90s like disney films like you know the little mermaid the lion king yeah. i loved drawing those so and i even what is it? i was even gosh i was into a lot of <laughs> genres as a kid well like the kids in my class were really into ninja turtles like when i was in first grade so i started i hadn't seen them you know i don't think my parents let me watch them because you know they're just kicking ass all the time <laughs> but, like, <laughs> i drew them i saw them like i got you i'll draw you <laughs> michelangelo whatever but yeah, no, I, illustration was, um, just another, uh, just another route I took with art. Yeah. And, um, I think, you know, I think most of my childhood, I kind of saw myself becoming an illustrator just because that's what I was into. Um, but it's just now, now it's just one more, you know, really specific genre in this thing called art that I appreciate. And this thing called art, I, I like yeah. that because it has a loose connection to the Animaniacs with an episode when he had a uh, Prince on, and this thing called <laughs> Life, or what have you. <laughs> <laughs> they always have the best guest stars, they? and bring on real people. I loved it. 
you know, of course, uh, okay. I enjoyed the good feathers on there as well. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, I like, yeah, no, they were hilarious. Like I, <laughs> That and God, Ren and Stimpy. I got into Ren and Stimpy. Um, oh, yeah. Just those were, I, you know, I watched them like as a, as a, like a late teen and a, an adult in my 20s. I was like, these are demented. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I liked them at the time, but I had no idea how demented they were. Like, <laughs> just it, it, they're dark. They're dark. So it, I, it's one of, it's one of those things where, for me, like if it's animated, it's like this is for you. And when you see something like that, it's like this is this is not for kids. This is <laughs> left. And then it, it, it is, <laughs> yeah, no, it's for people like in their basement who kidnap people because there was like an episode. <laughs> what is it? There was an episode where Mister Horse kidnapped a walrus, and <laughs> what is it? He was hiding him in his house, and like. <laughs> so as there were some people going door to door, so <laughs> I can't say it. They were selling rubber nipples and you know from bottles. And he answers the door. Mr. Horace has like I don't know where he was wearing them, but he was literally wearing them. Like he had some on his elbows, I think, and his knees. And then that poor walrus comes out at the end. And he just says, "Call the police." <laughs> it's, it's, it's so dark. It's not for kids. It's not no, for kids. No, it's like true. It's like. It's like true crime and animation. <laughs> right, right. So let, let's talk about um, sort Sorry. of. No, 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 no. That's 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 great, actually. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about because your 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 background is not only the visual arts, which we're going to dive into a bit mm-hmm. more, but also there, there's writing in there. So how does like your creative writing and, and and poetry sort of inform the visual art practice and the themes that are explored within your work? Oh, sure. I think I would have to say it's very, very loose. Um, it's um, more of a tone and a mood and a very, maybe a turn of phrase even, um, rather than basing, you know, a work of art off of a piece of writing I did. Like, more often than not these days, I'll just pull, um, you know, a phrase um, from my poems. Um, and I'm still, uh, I'm still really working on how to thread those two practices together. Yeah. Like, um, I'm thinking of different ways, uh, to have text show up in my work other than just literally showing up very in it, you know? So uh, what is it? And I would say, you know, that part uh, the writing part of my practice has been there for a long time, too. I remember very much getting into books and writing as a very young child, too. And so I was so excited to be able to read it. <laughs> I just spent, you know, a lot of the time going to the libraries and running through them. And um, I think I think that's the way it's going to be, you know, my whole life. Like, sometimes, I, you know, people will ask, you know, you have to choose one thing or the other. And I don't think I've ever been the type of person to choose one thing or the other. It's all... It's all there. It's always going to be there. And, um, yeah, so right at the moment, it's very it's very um, loose and abstractly tied. Um, and maybe it'll show up in a different way in the future. Um, but really, it's these days, it's a tone and a mood. Like, I go from there, like the feel of this poem. Yeah. And what's that work going to look like? So you feel like it's almost this sort of, I was burying a lead just to scotch there, but purposefully. Um, so tell us about like your, your process within the, the visual arts side. Cause I told you we were going to get back to that. So let, let's talk mm-hmm. about your process from conception to like creation. And there's a second part to that, but I at least want to start off there just not to give you, here's everything. Here's my word vomit. Enjoy. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> but uh, tell us about your process. Oh gosh. Um, it, it really takes two um, two distinct directions these days. Um, there's the part of my process that really surfaces just from uh, working in the studio and doing material explorations and, um, uh, you know, trying different techniques. So it's not rare, I think, for visual artists to just kind of stumble upon something that really 
really sticks with you. And oftentimes it'll come across just, what is it? In my mind, I always have this list of things I want to try in the studio. You know, this to-do list. If I have, if I try to tell myself, well, I don't got anything to do, I, you know, I, I'm like, no, pull out the ideas, try it. Um, so there's that part of it where I'll come across like, I want to see what this material looks like layered with this. And so I'll try it. Um, so that's pretty, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty the standard yeah. way a, a visual artist will operate so I'm no different in that respect but then there's the the part of my practice these days where um, once I just once I find you know material man, manipulation that works with my uh, the text I'm incorporating you know mm -hmm. then I'll try to you know flesh it out and do a series um, and so I really you know tried to be more disciplined in that respect really follow an idea uh, in its iterations and instead of just hopping from one little exploration to another, which is something um, I do just because it's fun. I'm definitely an artist that I can't do the same thing every day in the studio without getting bored quickly. Um, so these days it's definitely, um, what is it? I found, I found a way because I think the past couple of years I was trying to see if I could um, really spatially parse down my practice and to work smaller um, when I was uh in graduate school, my works were, you know, medium to large scale um, towards the end there. They were mural sized in some, some instances. And um, I was like, well, can I do, can I do this, um, you know, abstraction with glowing text on paper? Like, what would that look like? How is it, how is it going to look? So I've really spent the past two years trying to work smaller on paper and um, my most recent works are, you know, a series of god they're like 30 30 small drawings now and i found something i was like okay this this doesn't bore me it has room to grow and branch and that's where i am so yeah it, it takes a couple different directions these days I, I like when there's that opportunity to kind of do what you're doing like stay within like i'm a visual artist writer doing mm -hmm. what i enjoy but maybe looking at it from a different perspective so you know as i was telling you about earlier and doing these like sort of other series or what have you i'm still doing what i'm doing but i'm trying to stretch the boundaries of what that might look like to keep it mm -hmm. one interesting and challenging yeah. and uh because if you're just doing the same thing i could just say hey spit out a bunch of questions let me ask every artist the same question here's the visual artist questions oh let me put a writer question in there and there's limited variety or even in doing like you get into a conversation i, I remember it was one I recorded yesterday that I thought it was going to be about 35 minutes and it ended mm -hmm. up being an hour and 20 because we were just improv and just, just mm -hmm. kind of talking and it came off maybe more natural um, than, you know, having yeah. a framework, you know, you have a framework of questions and a guideline that you're going to go with it. Like, here's my canvas, if you will. Oh, but yeah. um, what am I going to, what am I going to get at the end of the day from this? Yes, absolutely. And I enjoy the broadest of frameworks. Like it, I don't, I absolutely don't like to, um, you know, be an artist that writes down rules for yourself and you make yourself follow them. Like I have heard about some, some people who are very just married to their process and like, it's going to come out that way. Was it? You're going to go in that studio and from like, you know, eight to five, you're, you're going to draw like the same shit every day. And that, um, you end up with a cohesive body of work, right? But is it work you enjoy? And is it work that like, says anything to anybody else you know it's, mm -hmm. it's a that's that's really the question um yeah no i'm absolutely and i i think what is it when when talking with artists it would definitely uh gosh it would be a terrible shame to ask the same people you know the same question because you're yeah you're not getting you don't, you don't want that like no, yeah, the okay. loosest of scripts yeah the loosest of scripts works for art and for podcasts because it almost turns into uh, uh, content versus like creation, and mm -hmm. and and, I, and the second question actually kind of ties into that. But I at least want to mm -hmm. say say this: where you think when we get into this point where we're we're doing content, it's like this sort of notion of asking, let's say, you know, in these different interviews. If it naturally comes up, sure. But if it's mm -hmm. just like here's a script that I go by and I ask everyone these same five questions, then that makes it almost digestible and reformatable for uh, long tail, short tail content. This makes it, you know, an Instagram clip or what have you. And it's like that's not the purpose of this. That's not mm -hmm. why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. But in that exactly. vein, 
in that vein. Everything mm-hmm. is content. Everything is content. So in terms of sharing your process, uh, how do you determine which parts of maybe work that's in, in process that you want to share, maybe process components that you want to share, just different things that mm-hmm. are leading up to, you know, potentially the kind of finished part. Cause I know visual artists never quite, quite finished painters, never quite finished. So, sure. so sure. what parts do you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. No, we, I, 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 you know, I don't even think it's art, like visual artists that agonize over that. I think writers do too. And I definitely am that way as a writer. Exactly. Um, uh, but no, I, I, at some point, I just have to look at what has come out of the ideas and mm-hmm. the process, like, like, and look for those content threads. Like, am I sticking to a similar theme with these works? Do they are they in any way thematically tied, content wise? Are they um, are they tied in how I made them? And you know what I. I Sometimes I've, I've been very wrong. Sometimes I've started some work and, you know, just poo pooed it. And I'm like, all right, that's trash. And it goes in the drawer and then I'll pull it out, you know, a year later and I'll see new potential. So sometimes your instincts, you know, will lead you astray. But most of the time, most of the time, I, I really just go with, uh, you know, have I seen this before? Is this interesting? Is this anything? I would want to look at <laughs> and talk about, you know? So I really, I really look for, you know, um, trying to do something new and that's, God, that's a tall order, you know, it's a tall order, but, um, that's, that's what I'm really looking for. Um, trying things that I haven't seen before. Um, so that's what I sort out. That's what I try to show people because I do a lot of, uh, you know, Work I would just characterize as you know just abstract works, abstract paintings, and those those typically they work in the way I mentioned earlier. Like I'll figure out some material nip- manipulation I could use later, but um, you know I store those away. They're like little uh, exercises I call them exercises. Um, you know I heard I think this was as an undergraduate, but I remember hearing um, a poet talk at my school. Ed Kuzier, and he was talking about his process, and he said, you know, he worked most days. You know, he wrote poems most days, but he said, ultimately, he only shows, like, 12 <laughs> to people here. You know, he, I guess between him and his editor, they decided, you know. And that, to me, I loved hearing that because I was under the impression of everything I made needed to be good. Like, <laughs> and that is ridiculous, you know. That's, that's absurd. Um, even, even people who are capable... Uh, if you know amazing works are going to turn out really mediocre stuff from day to day and that's fine i have kind of i have to remind myself that's fine you know the the important part is that you are working at it in new ways you know go back to it i I think i think that that's a very crucial point there where you know, maybe let's say I, I, thought, I start thinking of musicians and, you know, maybe some mm-hmm. music related questions or musicality related questions that are coming up. Mm-hmm. But yeah. um, I think about like musicians and, you know, or, you know, it, it's not disposable per se, but it may be this didn't make the cut for the album. We're going to do 13 mm-hmm. songs on the album. We recorded 50. So mm-hmm. all of those aren't going to make it. There may be yeah. a deluxe edition. It may be, hey, you know what? This isn't this is B quality, but I can at least put this out later or what have you. Or even this idea where, you know, not every interview one may do has the same energy and feeling around it, but mm-hmm. ultimately what comes out of it, whether it's the lesson, whether it's something you learn in the process or what have you that comes out of it makes you better and improve for maybe that next interview or the next series of interviews, you're getting something out of it. Um, yeah. that kind of helps you move along and grow as a creator, as an artist. Exactly. It keeps you sharp. You know, it keeps you, uh, there is a such thing as getting rusty <laughs> in art. And some people tell you otherwise, but I found it to be true. Like you, like anything you'll, you'll, you take enough time off of it. You won't know where to begin once you get back in there. So, um, yeah, it keeps you in practice. The creative muscle memory. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's it's tiring to flex that muscle. <laughs> we have to do it. 
So could you describe? I read this this in your um, in, in your bio. I'm looking at again the the the, the Baker um, it's the Baker Art like page or have Baker Artist page, uh-huh. and I read about uh, this this idea of like the musicality and language. Could you speak a little bit on that? Oh yes, um, to me, um, language language has a musicality because to me it's similar. Um, to poetry and music um, and that it has like a, you know, it's got a rhythm. It's got a, there's a cadence to the way people talk, you know, every, everybody, like they, they speak differently, individual to individual, you know, they have a register yeah. or what is it? A dynamic to their voice. You know, how, how, what volume do they speak? Um, God. And even, even noise, <laughs> like some people, <laughs> Some people, you know, do a lot of, you know, grunting and mm, and hemming and hawing, you know. Um, And I like language for that reason. Not just, God, not just like speaking, although I do very much appreciate it in day-to-day speak. And I'm very much a fan of accents, you know, of all all kinds. Like, I think they're great. They're fascinating. They tell you so much, you know. Um, But that's to me text is the same way like like the way writers put words together like good writers you know good writers that stick with you they they you know they spend a lot of time considering the order in which they put those words the words they chose to include the ones they took out like to me it's a uh, god it's it's very much parallel to music in that sense um yeah that's how i look at it yeah, I, I I like the use use of um of, of diction. Like I I, I watch uh, Succession, right? And I like uh-huh. Tom Wom's game because he talks in a very specific way, and it's like that's my guy. I'm waiting to hear what uh-huh. he says and how he says it. And it's definitely you're right. There is a certain musicality there that you're like, oh, it's like you're playing an instrument. It's almost it's almost. Like 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 I like I like rap music, and you're almost yeah, waiting yeah. for a person to pop on a song and approach it in a certain way. It's almost the same way I look to hear for somebody talking. It's like, oh wow, you you strung those words together in that way, and if there's yes. a certain accent to it, it's like, oh, this is this is like an instrument. Got it. <laughs> it is, yeah. It, it's you're absolutely right to bring up acting because it is, yeah. They're giving a performance. It's is in many ways similar to the way, you know, people recording artists do a performance or people do live music, like, and God, that's everything. It's like your, it's like your signature style. You know, I love, I'm very much, uh, in, you know, into music and I used to play and sing in like my younger days, but I, I love like being able to, what is it? A song comes on. I've never heard, but I know who it is. Like I can tell by their voice, (laughs) I can tell by their delivery and yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, those modes of expression, yeah, I just see see lots of parallels um, between language, text, and music, and not just was it not just music that involves words, you know, instrumental music too. I I spend a lot of time listening to instrumental music, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, especially if I'm trying to go to sleep, like I, I'm a, I have trouble sleeping. And uh, which is probably why I do so many podcasts. Uh, and <laughs> Makes sense now. <laughs> my, my secret. Um, I get I, it. I, I think you know. I'll put on maybe like sometimes if I'm, I need to process something in a different way, I'll throw on an audio book and I'll listen to that. And if there's other times where it's just like I'm not sleeping for whatever reason, um, it's a little bit more dis- disrupted sleep, and it's like an ongoing thing. A reset for me is let's just put on something. Let's just put on sounds. It's not whale sounds. I don't need the whales. You know, I might need like those Bob Ariel beats or something like that, or even like even classical music, something that doesn't distract me because those, the words are another part of it. And I find if, you know, if I'm coding or something, or if I'm like processing a lot of information and I need no distractions, it's gotta be just, it's got to be like just no no lyrics it has to be straight instrumentation. It's, it's so true. I I can't not listen to the words if there's words in it. Um, and that's that's why I I I think of when I go like to the BSO performances, they're very relaxing to me. Um, mm-hmm. Even if the music is agitated, you know, <laughs> um, it's just it's a whole it's a whole it's a whole other level, and it's more. 
and you know, like you said, it's it's parsed down and it's uh, it's more focused. But I, I like that about it. It's definitely it's it's got its own unique and value. Was it really valuable role? How does your art practice connect like visual art with language and in science? I recall reading that. Like, what sort of insight does this intersection offer into the connection between mm-hmm. like these these fields? Like, we talk more and more about what STEAM. You know that that area will have you putting the arts within STEM. So let's talk about that a little bit. Oh God, it's yeah. No, I get really up on my high horse about it being STEAM and not STEM because I would say I can't divorce you know visual art from ways that it is really based in chemistry, like especially painting. Um, and what is it, if you're sculpting? It's based in physics, like. <laughs> You know, you have to have knowledge about the way your materials interact with the, with the physical world. Um, and I'd say, I think it was like last summer, I was I, I have siblings who are in the more hard sciences, so to speak, um, of the STEAM end, you know, and the computer end and the, and the um, chemistry and geology end. And they... We talk. We we talk so much about this stuff, um, and I noticed. What is it? My sister was getting. She was doing like a geology course, and she was showing me these. They call them thin sections of rocks, and they, I guess, um, basically shave off a part of a rock, and you get it down to like a few millimeters, and then you put it under this microscope and you know for light at it, and then you see these very very um, visually beautiful forms and shapes and textures and I was floored I was floored I was like oh my god that's what my sketchbook looks like <laughs> like this is what comes out of me um I just noticed that god um all those abstractions I'm doing they're really bio I've heard it before of course like your work looks like uh water or space or you know landscapes and rocks but I didn't really realize that it was um, both at a, a macro and a micro level. Like it looks like tree bark, um, but it also like looks like <laughs> the inside of a, a of a rock or a, a meteorite. And so um, that that part of it's there. But then there's also with this um, in terms of like the work that's glowing. Yeah. Um, I. I, I had to really, or I wanted to really understand at a basic level, like what's going on scientifically with these works. Like, why, I want to be able to tell people why do some of them still glow when they take the work, you know, when they take the UV light off of it. Why, why does the light fade? Why does it not always just, you know, steadily stream in the dark? And um, it's really, it got me on a whole, <laughs> a whole very, very fun, uh, you know, different kind of research uh, tunnel where I was looking up uh, not just like the physics of light and watching novas about space time travel but I was also like I was I was exploring the ways in which like you know a lot of organisms you know emit life uh, or emit light you know that's a that's a sign process um it's a non-verbal process but that's a communication process and then i just got geeking because i'm like (laughs) it's more of those themes and it's just more ways to uh gosh to bring in you know science and to have a fun research thread to your work and um but yeah like some of my work is was it made it's made with materials that are phosphorescent and so like they'll glow a bit after you take that light away and then some of them are just fluorescent like they'll glow when that light's on and then nothing at all so i like to play with those um you know kind of uh physical facts of light um in the visual art too and it keeps it very keeps it very um and in like, like intellectually interesting to me and also it keeps it um, keeps it very what is it it brings an interactivity and playfulness into the work that I would say my work before didn't really have so it just there's a whole new aspect to it like I was um, you know I was inviting people to really explore what light can do in the work so yeah I hope <laughs> that was a long answer but I hope I hope um, it made sense 
It did. And it actually answered a question that I didn't write in because I was going to ask you about light, but I think I got some of that answered there. So <laughs> shout out to you. You kind of got the thing. You, you're like, you kind of tapped in. Like, I know what Rob is thinking. And there you go. So so shout out to you on that. Light. Yeah. Light is fun. Light, light is, light's ridiculous. It's, um, I don't know. I, <laughs> it, it brings, it brings in a whole new appreciation of art because like, like if we don't have any light. We're not going to see any art. Like it's very mm-hmm. basic. It's very basic. And like, if you're a painter, like you have to appreciate light. Like, and for and photographers as well, you know, like, you know, oh. they, they're always playing with light. Of course. Yeah. Videographers. And so, yeah, to me, it's so funny that they would come up with an acronym like STEM and not include art because there's so many jobs for artists mm-hmm. that you have to know the tech and the science of it, or else you're just crud. <laughs> like you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, you gotta have the basics. And so it's it's just ever excluding the creative class, the artists of the world, always excluding them from the bigger conversations. And yeah. you're right, you know, it's it's yeah. sort of this this overlap and. I, I'll say, like, I started thinking more and more about the conversation of the market, business, and how that goes with art. And there needs to be more of some of those conversations um, mm-hmm. that just brings it together because there's naturally going to be overlap. Like, I think a lot of artists are entrepreneurs or at least have some sense. And a lot of entrepreneurs are creative in a way that there's art to different things Um, going back to the sort of musicality thing, right? Where you can have a conversation and give very specific details and be very technically sound and not get the deal, you know, as an entrepreneur. And then you can say something that sounds really good and it's just no merit to it. But it's like, you know what? We like what you said. We like the way that you delivered that, you know, we're going to give you this grant. We're going to give you this funding. So there's, there's an art to that. There's a skill to that. And I think sort of more of those conversations and those sort of intersections and even bringing in the science thing, because there is definitely there. And I think more of that needs to happen instead of folks being siloed to you do this, moving on, you do that, moving on. Yes. Yes. Because if you really do want to make a career out of it, like you've got to be able to do, gosh, you have to wear so many hats (laughs) and a lot of them I found are very uncomfortable hats. Like, and I almost wish there was, (laughs) what is it? I was talking with, I was talking with somebody. I'm like, where was the class for networking and schmoozing in grad school? Because I didn't take it and I needed it. <laughs> I, like, I'm just learning it. I'm just learning it in this this spot now. And people are like, oh, yeah, you talk, you're great on stage. I was like, no, I am not. I have this glass shield of shame and embarrassment that I call a computer <laughs> screen that prevents me from making a tit out of myself in front of people. I get that. Like, I get that. I've, I've thought about that a long time. <laughs> I was just like, what do why do I need to learn that stuff? That stuff, yeah. Well, yeah. Let's, it's it's a it's a constant reframing for me. Like if it's you know because I have a I have a business degree and it's like hey work at Rome do this and apply those skills. It's like I was a business a bachelor's of science. I was an IT guy. That's what I was yeah. doing. And those God. are different skills. It's not Joe marketing guy. <sighs> yeah. No. And they're they're very different. And I I admire those people like that. That is absolutely a skill. I don't mm-hmm. know if it can be taught. <laughs> I think but it's I a practice. To, I think it's practice. Yeah, yeah. you got to learn it. you got to learn it. Like, I, I was forced in school to talk to people, and I was very uncomfortable about talking about my art when like, and I started. And I was, I was just agonizing over it. But I got better. They yeah. made, what is it? it the, what is that therapy? Um, immersion therapy, yeah. right? They just throw you into the snakes, and you're going to find a way. <laughs> and now look, you're doing podcasts yeah. and such, talking about your work exactly. and talking about what goes into it. So yes. <laughs> which, which brings me to this question. Um, how, how's your background in teaching? Because that's another thing that's there. Background in teaching and curating okay. impacted your artistic practice, um, your your creative sensibilities, your, your goals. Talk about that a little bit. Um, I think in a positive way, there, it's, there's both positive and negative uh, kind of aspects to that. Um, in a positive way, it has really made me think about what I'm trying to say with my art and how am I saying it. It's made me be thoughtful about the content of it. Because when you're teaching, uh, what is it, 
um, styles of art to people, contemporary artists, historical artists, like there's uncomfortable things that come up, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> historically there's things that are just terribly horrible and unpleasant, but like, I don't know, it, being a teacher has, um, enabled me to kind of acknowledge those things, um, that come up, you know, that, um, are problematic, you know, yeah. um, like a lot of, what is it, historical nudes, you know, they're very problematic and those art practices are, but, um, you know, we still show them, we look at them and really they've taken on a whole different content. Like I've noticed in years, like I don't show work like that. But I was explaining it to somebody, you know, I was like, well, it used to be about ideal form, you know, Mm -hmm. celebrating beautiful bodies. And now it's more like visibility. It's like, who's, who are we looking at? Who are we noticing now? Who's worthy of being in a work of art? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, a lot of times, um, I think it's made me think about how, what I put in my art Mm -hmm. more critically, um, and how to be received you know um what is it like a negative part of it though i i noticed like what is it i i'm not teaching full-time right now and that's like for like the first time in like 12 years i'm like oh my god (laughs) i'm like i have time to think about my art and make my art like um and it would take you know it just take up a lot of your energy and a lot of your uh is it your emotional energy too, physical and emotional energy. And I, and the paycheck was so poor. And so like, I really thought about that. I was like, I spent that much time doing it. <laughs> yeah. Was it worth it? And, you know, I really, I really loved, like, I really do love teaching, teaching art. I love discussing it with people um, of all ages. Like I worked with all ages, like little tots up to high schoolers and, um, I don't think, yeah, I don't see myself going back to teaching in that setting anymore just because they, they want your soul and your heart and everything. And it's like, when, <laughs> when is enough enough? I, I remember talking with one of my professors, I was like, they really, they celebrate martyrdom and I don't want to be a martyr <laughs> it's right. for our education. You know, I want to have, I want to preserve something for my own practice. So yeah. yeah. One of the, you know, I'm like, I'm at this this sort of stage where, you know, I think I was, you know, telling you before we got, got started into this, that, you know, multiple hats, all uncomfortable, none of them fit. And, uh, <laughs> yes. and it, it does take away, like if there are various buckets that, you know, we as individuals, we have to like spend time, like, you know, your art might not necessarily be the you bucket. There may be a separate bucket. Like my art is something that I'm working on. It takes time, it takes energy and so on. The job is a separate bucket. Uh, family life, a separate bucket. Socializing, separate buckets. And it's like <laughs> you start making these sort of deals internally of where am I going to put this time at? And am I going to be exhausted when I'm putting that time? Like when I'm doing, at one point I remember I did six podcasts in a day. And <sighs> And I was just like, <laughs> I don't, and I don't want to drag, you know, I want to give everyone their due. I have no control over if the interview is going to be good or whatever, well received or what have you, but oh. I, I don't want to like, you know, half ass it and, yeah. you know, because I'm exhausted or what have you. So I try to be more mindful of that, but still it, it, it is work. It is stuff that you, we're, we're working on and it's fun work is, you know, work to play and all of that, that loop. But yeah. You know, certain things take maybe backseat, um, especially when more opportunities present themselves. And the martyrdom thing is real, as I yeah. find that, you know, there have been people who don't have much energy or support who've maybe flaked on four or five interviews. And it's like, I prep, I book studio space, I'm doing these different things. Uh, and it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. So hard. And um, it's like, we love seeing the struggle, you know, we love seeing the work that you're putting in. It's like, yeah, help me take this to this next level or help yeah. me get this interview with this person or whatever uh, it might be. So there's a certain sense of that yeah. martyrdom that goes across the board, I think. Yeah. Like I want, I think, I think anybody in the creative field and has to do as many, what is it, unique jobs like you have so many unique jobs and it's ridiculous and we know it and 
I just wish it wouldn't be so expected of you and so celebrated. Like, um, like the, the, the whole hustle culture can be very uh, unattainable and toxic. Yeah. Um, like, I'm all about, like you said, working hard. Like, I want to put good work out there. And I want to be, um, you know, I want to put the best work out there I can. But I also don't want, like, I don't want to put myself um, in a position where I can't have time to myself and my family. Um, yeah. You know, like, that's, it's like what you were talking about with those negotiations. How much energy am I going to put into that bucket? And how many buckets are there? <laughs> like, how many buckets are there? Um, and then, and then so recognizing not. that it's the buckets are there because the ceiling is leaking. That's that's the thing. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's leaking with responsibilities <laughs> or what have you. You're like, look, I got to get this bucket down. Damn, it's a new leak. Something else to do. And, you yeah. know, a lot of it yep. is great. You know, sometimes it's leaking whiskey, yeah. and it's like, oh, let me get some of that. But, but other times, it's like, this is this is cat piss. I didn't want that in it at yeah, all. Yeah, exactly. I just described that one needs to be thrown out and never. I just described yeah, work is cat piss. <laughs> That's great, actually. So, I got I got one more real, real question. I think that um, that that connects really well um, with with that last piece we were talking there. Mm-hmm. How do you define success as an artist, as a person? Um, are you, are you there yet? Are you in that direction? And ultimately what do you hope to accomplish in the next year or so? Mm. Yeah. I was thinking about that. I, uh, when you said that, um, I see it in really kind of separate compartmentalized ways for myself and myself as an artist so like I was uh, for myself as an artist absolutely I want to do more local shows and more solo shows like it's been a few years since I've done a solo show I'm like oh god I want to do that again I love being able to you know fill a space with just my ideas like um, I think you had mentioned it before like I like the shows I've done are like a lot of group shows lately, you know, a lot of out of state shows and stuff. And so what is it? Sometimes it doesn't feel was you miss out on the fun part of, of an art show where like if it's out of state and you don't see it, like you don't, you don't know how the art necessarily interacted with the other works, unless these Mm -hmm. galleries put it up on social media. Um, you don't know what is it? You miss out on the, what is it, the connectivity you get and the relationships you get with other artists. So definitely um, as a goal for success as an artist here, I want to, I want to, you know, build more relationships yeah. within the community, you know, not keep such a, a low profile. Um, share my work more with like, uh, you know, more locally um, and just have more shows. Like that's fun. That's of course, I, I was thinking of like, solo shows being like when you put out an album like you work on those ideas and you work on that um those pieces for you know usually a few years before they come out and yeah i like that kind of structure to it It makes people like me who has a lot of different was who have a lot of different aspects to their practice focus it and that's helpful so i love that um yeah and i was also thinking in terms of what is it success as an artist yeah the success as an artist would be you know being both visible but also giving something to your community um you know being making sure everybody can see your art you know i think that's part of the job um i'd like to work on that um as a person as a person i think like we talked about uh work better on I would say authentic relationship building within mm-hmm. the profession. I feel very gross every time I have to like ask for a reference letter or put people down as a reference. Like I feel like I'm really bugging them, you know, but I really, I really need, I want to reframe it and I want to get better at like, no, I, I want to talk to this person because I admire the work. First yeah. of all, I admire the work and I want to know, the ideas behind it and so to me that's authentic that's not gross yeah. um so yeah i want to quit uh being shy about it <laughs> that's i mean <laughs> you know? that, that's something i had to kind of get over in, in doing this like you yeah. know I, I appreciate 
the the community and I do a certain broad thing like in talking with artists and you know folks in in culture broadly and you know sometimes it's like you get some of these sort of unkind emails and it makes you gun shy these unkind responses it makes you shy that you're already shy and you're like I don't, I don't have it and sometimes you just have people that you're like wow I thought we connected hey maybe we're friends or whatever and uh-huh. no, that's that's not necessarily the case it's just like we we had a cool conversation and that's kind of that and Uh um but yeah i think you know especially like when you're in a a certain scene it's like i see you i see you regularly i see you in this space hey i'm gonna say hello and you know some of those sort of interactions where i don't think it's done with malice but it does throw it off a bit it's like oh all right had you in this thing and it didn't really work out (laughs) Oh, God. And, you know, Rob, it just made me think of how weird the past few years have been with the pandemic in that sense. Because I, you know, we've all been wearing masks for a few years. (laughs) And I've, like, shown up at openings and, like, what is it? People, like, we don't recognize each other any longer. Like, I'm embarrassed myself. (laughs) People I've worked with don't recognize me out of context, like, in the studio with them. And so it's weird. So... It's like it it upped the awkwardness. I think the pandemic did because nobody can face read anymore. <laughs> like this is why I wanted to come up with a see through mask because people just look for my squinty <laughs> eyes and they're like, because like. <laughs> In person, like I'm six four, but in in this land, I'm just a little dude in a box. People think I'm short, so yeah. when, it, when I pop up in reality, it's like, is that is that Rob? Yeah, we see you on a little square. See, yeah, exactly that. It's exactly that. So yeah, oh, or they're waiting for me to talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah that part of it oh my gosh um, and i ne- and i never talk when i go out i never talk to anyone so it's like i think rob lee is here i never say anything and then it's like <laughs> <laughs> well if i see you i'll 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 absolutely say hi and it's okay if you don't know who i am because like you do a shit ton of these podcasts <laughs> i was like it's oh fun. that's cluff right there <laughs> yeah yeah oh my god but Okay, you know what? There's another part of this. I want I want to be like I want to try to be a more. Uh, I want I want to explore like the more like relationship building of life, like being a good friend, being a good uh, sister and a good daughter and all that. Like, yeah. <laughs> was I'd say coming from Midwestern parents, they're uh, they're so Midwestern culture is so um, especially like the more northern Midwestern people which are my parents like Nebraskans you know they're very hardworking but humble and quiet and stoic people and like I side hug my dad you know and so <laughs> like I have to I didn't really I love my parents I love my family they're they're, they're great but like I didn't learn how to socialize <laughs> like hey so, yeah so that's being a good person is really to me like oh you know what? like uh what is it letting people know you care about them yeah. you know and then following through so i'm working on all of that <laughs> i like i like hearing that though that's 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 yeah. really good and i think me you know, definitely it's a i think a message that a lot more people can because of the sort of hustle that we lose that bit we lose those pieces of culture you know that oh well i don't have time for that and it's like well you need to make time and, you know, I, I, you know, as we're recording this, it's sort of around like a, you know, it's in the holiday season as we're recording this. And, you know, I made it a point to kind of reach out to some of my people. You know, I can't reach out to everyone's 500 interviews plus or what have you. But, you mm-hmm. know, I reach out to some people and say, hey, man, I haven't seen you in a while. I hope everything is well. And, and say, hey, man, we got to get up soon. Just schedule a date, set a date or what have you. Mm-hmm. I think those things just become kind of became kind of deprecated. And we just yes. don't do that anymore. It's like, well, I saw you on Twitter. No. Yeah. And I got really lazy. I don't know if I've always been this lazy, but I noticed this bad habit of mine. Like when I do want to socialize, just like once in a blue moon, like I'll get out and I, I'll, I'll be lazy about it. I'll ask, I'll, I'll send a mass text to my friends. And I'm like, do you want to hang out? And that is terrible. I, I had to examine that. I'm like, that is the laziest shit I've ever seen. It's like, lazy. you know, like, no, I need to specifically, you know, make time one on one with people. And so, yeah, I, I, I have a bad habit of downplaying how important that is. Um, and one thing that I've gotten to doing 
Um, and, and this is where we'll close at before we get to those rapid fire questions. Uh, I've gotten into doing um, like like thank you notes, like you know, to uh-huh. especially if I'm. You know, someone gives me a, a studio visit or what have you. It's like you're welcoming – this is going to sound so metaphysic or whatever. You're welcoming my energy into your creative space, and that, yeah. that matters. That means something. Or there's been some times where I've – and I really like chefs. And there's been some times I had the opportunity to cook with chefs. Oh, and they cool. show me something. So I'm like, all right, here's a thank you note. Here's like a piece of merch or something. That's, there's uh-huh. an exchange. And I think it's a way of doing things. That's To me, that's a very – I I think thank you notes are a really authentic gesture because especially if you, you know, you mail it, you put it in the mail, like you write that note, you stamp it. Like that's, yeah, I, I think that's a big deal. And you're absolutely right. Like, and I've always, whenever I, I've written them, I, I'm like, I finally, I did it right that time. You know, I'm like (laughs) way too happy. I got it done. Cause yeah, my to-do lists are dumb. Like I really, this is horrible. I got thank you notes I have to write from like a couple years ago. Oh. Like I'm bad. I'm a shithead. <laughs> There's this thank you but note gonna, that's I'm been lost better. in the mail. <laughs> I'm getting better. Yeah, no, I'm gonna get better. That's my goal. Okay. Well, thank you. I think I think we got it. I think we got it. And now I got five rapid fire questions for you. Don't All overthink right. them. I've I've been adding them as we've been talking. Don't overthink them. Uh, yeah. They're fun questions. Uh, brevity is key here. Here's the first one. Okay. Are you more of a thinker or a doer? Thinker. I'm going to save this last one because I think it's really funny. Uh, what is your favorite accent? We talked about that a little bit earlier. <laughs> Absolutely Southern. Okay. Southern accents. When I moved down to Oklahoma, I was initially horrified and then <laughs> and then I loved them like and I only learned to love them at, and when I picked it up <laughs> like I subconsciously picked it up no I love southern accents there's a possibility that I may relocate to New Orleans and I already have my alias and everything set up as Robert Delacroix and I <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, it's perfect. No, good choice. Good choice. I, this, this podcaster well, suddenly is a radio guy. We will have to talk about aliases another time, though, because I, I have them too. Like I have online presence that I've had. I, I don't have to give it. I don't have to say it publicly, but like my Facebook is an alias, and it's been that way since like two thousand six. And uh, yeah, I'm all about that. I'm all about that. That's perfect. Robert. Robert Delacroix. Uh, yeah. What is your favorite genre of music? Psychedelic folk. That's very specific. I like it. <laughs> uh, are you an early bird or a night owl? And I feel really good that I came up with that sort of wording. Oh, uh, absolutely night owl. Okay. I dread every morning. Lastly. This this is something that I, I really I'm really looking forward to get an answer on. What is the most overused word in quote unquote art conversations? Like just one that makes you cringe and like you could have said something better. I am over it. Detritus. Really? Yeah, maybe that's very specific. Um, I hear a lot. Well, God, there's a lot of there's a lot of art speak in art artist statements about people talking about detritus it's visual artists and i'm even an appreciator of detritus and it's just it what gets, is that it gets old it, it means like the the leftovers or trash the oh. overlooked stuff and so i that one's kind of that word is annoying because yeah a lot of people are just like what the fuck does that mean yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know what it meant either until I heard it, and then I kept hearing it, and kept hearing it, and kept hearing it. I was like, just call it trash. Just debris. It trash. Refuse. It's debris. Yeah, residue. Like, yeah. I don't know. That's You should always, as a writer, like use the word that's plain, and it's more it's clearer, you know? I've the, been guilty of, it, of using words like that sometimes, and it doesn't work. It never works. Don't use them. I'll say there's no detritus in this podcast, and... Uh, <laughs> And with that, no, you're on a tight ship. <laughs> and with that, I want to, I want to thank you for um, indulging me and in being on this podcast. And um, I want to invite and encourage you to tell the listeners where they can check you out um, and follow you and stay up to date on what you got going on. So the floor is yours. Oh well, 
Um, I would just like to say, um, follow my Instagram at Sarah with an H dot Clough. Clough. C L O U G H dot R. Um, I do process photos. I've gotten into some stupid reels lately. And you can join them the few hundreds <laughs> if you follow me because I'm bad. I'm bad at it. So, <laughs> um, but no, look, I, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. Yeah, follow that and uh, my website, www.saraclough.com. And yes, yeah. I just want to say it's a pleasure being on your podcast. Lots of fun. Thank you so much. And um, I'll wrap up there. So I'm Rob Lee for Sarah with an H, Clough, saying that there is art in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. Oh,